There is perhaps no other period in this century in which such a height of interest has existed for that area we now call ESP. Extrasensory perception means many things to many people. Recently, my Kreskin ESP game has received considerable attention, in part, I feel, because it has given to anyone interested the opportunity not only to have fun with the mind, but also to test one's ability for ESP, just as is being done at numerous universities throughout the world. This record contains a series of tests you will have the opportunity of experiencing yourself. Make no bones about it. The tests in themselves are not psychic phenomena, nor are they spiritualistic manifestations of any kind, though many people in the past actually believe them to be so. These tests will enable you to tap your unconscious level of thought. While you will find this fascinating, and I rather suspect at times amazing, you will also learn that there is an unrealized control existing deep within your unconscious, and you may tap it without dreams, without hypnotism or crystal balls or the like. We who have been keenly involved in ESP research suspect that such abilities occur largely on an unconscious level. Consequently, your experiences with these tests may create a mood or a readiness for serious testing of your own ESP potential. You know, the mind plays strange tricks upon us. Have you ever walked into a strange room or entered a city or had a conversation which left you with this vague feeling that you had been through it before? This is called the deja vu experience. What about the alarm clock mind which some individuals exhibit? It's this knack by which you can decide at bedtime exactly what hour you wish to awaken in the morning. And lo and behold, you do it without an alarm clock. How often have you found certain inner convictions which for no apparent rhyme or reason felt compelling? Later on, you found such hunches coming true. Now, all of these experiences are demonstrations of the unconscious activity in our personalities. And at the same time, they may give us insight to what was once considered occult occurrences. We can't be certain today just what is the answer to telepathy? And yet thought transference seems to be the most commonly accepted form of ESP. When the telephone rings and you feel certain who is calling, is this coincidence or is it unconscious reasoning or is it telepathy? Uh, frankly, I feel there are too many people who have unexpectedly and mysteriously known when a friend or relative was in trouble for us to simply chalk it up as mere coincidence. What is the explanation? Who knows? It's my hope, though, that as a mentalist, we can reverse the order of the letters ESP to PSE, that is, Phenomena Scientifically Explainable. Meanwhile, you're about to enter an uncanny world of your mind. Whether you are alone or with a group of friends, you will discover how to tap your unconscious. You will find yourself bringing forth information and ideas which you may have forgotten or never realized you knew. Finally, you're about to discover your own powers to hold an ESP party. We're now going to turn to developing a tool which is going to be both intriguing and rather revealing. You will be at a decided advantage if you have my Kreskin ESP game before you, since the pendulum I designed is especially suitable to rapid response, what with the makeup of the chain, the perfect balance of the bob, the contrasting design of the game board, as well as an area which is utilized for developing messages, dealing with names, numbers, and ideas. If you do not as yet have my game, make a temporary pendulum by taking a string of about nine or 10 inches in length. Tie to the end of the string a fairly heavy ring or similar small weight. Now on the back of your record jacket is duplicated a small part of my game board, namely the black and white yes, no design. Hold the pendulum as still as you can. I would suggest in the beginning that you have your elbow away from your side and do not rest it 
on a table or a surface of any kind. Now, allowing the pendulum to dangle, holding it by your thumb and first finger at the end, let the weight rest over the center of the circle, about a half an inch off of the center of that yes-no design. Make certain that your yes line runs up and down from you. In other words, that it is perpendicular to you while the no line runs sideways or horizontally. You can see this in the design on the record jacket. Your pendulum should be about a half an inch again off the surface of the board or the jacket. Now concentrate upon the yes line, which is the line that runs or moves away from you. As you do so, the pendulum will start to swing and down that line, following the direction. Keep thinking the yes line until you have the pendulum swinging up and down, in other words, towards you and away from you. The more you think yes, the greater will be the up and down swing. If you have any difficulty, just move your eyes up and down the line, and the pendulum will respond. Now that you have it, moving up and down the yes line, begin to think of the circle. And as you do so, the swing of the pendulum will begin to change and arc around until it moves literally around and around in a circular direction. Keep thinking circle until you have a definite circle pattern. When you get a circle response, begin to think in terms of the no. Now the circle, you'll notice, begins to widen and become rather oblong or rectangular in its area until slowly but surely it begins to swing back and forth, almost like a clock pendulum. You're now following the no line, having the pendulum move back and forth along the no line. By the way, any time you get a circle, in the tests which are described on this record, it usually indicates one of two things. Either I do not know the answer to the question or I do not wish to reveal the answer. Now, once you achieve any of these directional responses, you can easily will the pendulum to follow another direction and the pattern will gradually change. This particular segment is a conditioning phase before anyone plays any of the further pendulum tests, he should learn this basic skill. Hold the pendulum over the yes-no chart. Watch how automatically the pendulum is going to respond to the following questions. First, would you like to visit Hawaii? Watch the pendulum respond. It swings, indicating a definite answer. And as I said, if you ever obtain a circular response that either indicates I don't know the answer or I do not wish to reveal the answer. Now stop the pendulum in this way by lowering it till it touches the board. As soon as it touches and stops its direction, lift it off the board and await the next question. Do you think you'd like Limburger cheese? And notice in this question how rapidly your response takes place. This is often because you have particularly strong feelings about areas that have strong reactions. All right, stop the pendulum. Now for a rather personal question. Do you dye your hair? The response should be rather interesting. Of course, the only way you might control and prevent the response is just to drop the pendulum and set it aside. But we'll go on from here. Stop the pendulum. Have you ever been in love? Notice again that the response will either be a yes or a no or a circular response. Now, those who are observing the response of the pendulum may wish to address questions to the subject and the pendulum. 
We're now going to turn the pendulum into a sex detector. Historically, this goes far back into our culture. Anytime you hold that pendulum over an upturned palm of a boy or a man, the pendulum is going to swing back and forth in a direct line pattern. But the moment you hold it over a female's hand, it will start to formulate a circular movement. The intriguing thing about this little phenomena is that even if you forget that a line indicates a male and a circle indicates a female, if months from now you don't quite recall the correct patterns, all you have to do is to pick up the pendulum and hold it over someone's hand. It will follow the correct direction, a direct line swinging back and forth over a male hand and a circle over a female hand. Obviously, the directions that you are now hearing are becoming deeply impressed upon your unconscious mind, and in a sense, you've never really forgotten them. This is why the test succeeds. We are now going to play the lie detector test. Hold the pendulum over the board. If there are individuals seated watching in a party setting, they can actually adapt this to other areas of lie detection. But for the experiment, I'm going to name five colors. Of these five, think of your favorite. Red, yellow, blue, green, and orange. Think of your favorite color of those five. Now, each time you hear me name a color, answer no out loud. Even when you hear the color that you have in mind, answer no. The pendulum will swing no when no is the correct answer. However, when you lie and say no for your favorite color, watch, for the pendulum will suddenly swing yes. Now, at the end of each color I name, stop your pendulum and await the naming of the next color. The only necessary condition for this test is that you keep your color in your mind. The test has, of course, many adaptations, but watch the color reaction. Is your favorite color orange? You answer out loud, and of course, if you're telling the truth, the pendulum will swing back and forth in a no direction. If you're lying, it will suddenly swing yes. Stop your pendulum. Would you be thinking of green? Would you be thinking of yellow? Again, stop your pendulum. Now, would you be thinking of Blue, if you lie, it will go yes. Stop your pendulum. Would you be thinking of red? It's rather obvious that this test has many adaptations. We now come to a rather intriguing test in which a continual no response is going to suddenly change into a yes direction when the answer should be yes. Again, using the pendulum, hold it over the yes-no design. Think, if you will, of the number of brothers and or sisters that you have. Fix that number in your mind as you gaze at the pendulum and the yes-no chart. Now. Is the number of brothers and or sisters you have seven? Unless it is seven, you should be getting a no swing. Watch this swing, because rather dramatically, when I name the number you have in mind, it's going to suddenly revert to a yes pattern. Is it six? Would that be the number? Do you have five? five brothers and or sisters. How about four? 
is for the correct number. Would the correct number by any chance be three? If it isn't three, what about two? Is it two? And as I said, when I name the correct number, the pattern will change. Is it one? Do you have one brother or sister? Would the number be zero? That is none. The test I'm about to describe is perhaps one of the most uncanny that's possible utilizing the pendulum. What is so strange about the response is that even if the test does not succeed with complete accuracy, there is a response between two individuals that's absolutely strange and uncanny. One person should now stand holding the pendulum so that it dangles in front of him. Another individual who has also found he can work the pendulum readily and easily, in other words, a person who has conditioned himself, should now stand in front of the first individual. The second individual should keep his back turned so that he cannot see the pendulum of the person behind him. He should simply stand straight with his arms to his side, his feet together, and now his eyes closed. He's aware, of course, of one thing, that standing behind him is an individual with a pendulum. The pendulum is hanging, dangling from that person's fingers. Now the individual with the pendulum becomes a sender, and he wills his pendulum to swing either up and down, or sideways, or in a circle. The receiver, standing with his eyes closed, is now going to feel himself beginning to sway. Don't try to resist. Let yourself sway in any direction you feel inclined, whether forwards and back, whether sideways, or in a circle. My only suggestion is that, of course, you don't allow yourself to fall. What is rather intriguing is that you'll begin to find yourself swinging in the direction of the pendulum behind you. The game which I'm about to explain has components in it that may be that of telepathy, and that of the techniques utilized in the lie detector test. It's a rather fascinating game, and I suggest that if you have a group listening to this record consisting of four or more individuals, that you now participate in the experiment in crime detection. Here's what I want you to do. And once you understand the concept of this test, it'll be quite easy to merely lift the arm off of this particular band before you continue to the next experiment, since you do not require my voice once you begin. In my concerts throughout the world, one of the climaxes has often been the murder test. An individual leaves the stage. In this case, to imitate my theatrical experiment, one of you may now leave the room, even as my voice is explaining this experiment to the rest of the party. Make certain in leaving the room that you are beyond hearing distance of my voice. Now the individual should be out of the room. A member of the remaining group now should walk towards another individual places hands around the neck of the individual and in a kind of mock-like situation 
enact a murder as if he were strangling the person. Pressure is totally unimportant in this particular test. But there is one thing seriously that is important, and that is that the murder victim, for a mere moment or two, act as if he were collapsing, and the murderer act out the murder with a kind of artificial feeling of vengeance or anger or hatred. The reason for this is you must impress upon your mind a definite substantial feeling or else the individual returning to the room may have difficulty in picking up the correct impressions. Now, when you have finished this murder, when you have enacted it, the victim and the murderer should return to their earlier positions. Call your subject back into the room. Now the subject, utilizing the pendulum, is going to solve the murder. I'm going to explain this, and once the band is completed, the subject can follow it through. Hand the pendulum to one of the potential victims. Ask the person to hold the pendulum over the yes-no chart. You as subject and tester, literally as the mental detective, ask the pendulum simple questions, all of which will elicit no answers. For example, if it is clear outdoors, ask, is it raining? If the person is under the age of 90, ask, are you over 90 years of age? Ask approximately four or five questions, all of which you feel certain will give you a no response. Then suddenly ask, are you the murder victim? The subject, even though he is to answer no at all times, is suddenly going to reveal that he is indeed the murder victim. Now, the second part of this test can be done in the same way, but you can take it a step further and try it as a telepathy test. To do it as a telepathy test, you, the mental detective, advance to each of the potential suspects. Hold the pendulum over their head as they sit before you and ask, is this the murderer? While your results may not be as frequently accurate as the lie detector approach, you will be exercising a potential telepathic solving of a crime. Basically, there are three areas of extrasensory perception, telepathy, clairvoyancy, and precognition. Telepathy is the ability of one person to perceive the thoughts of another. Clairvoyancy is the supposed faculty of becoming aware of events or happenings of which no one has any knowledge. Precognition, of course, is an awareness or a learning of the future. Now, this is not a fortune-telling presentation, although for fun you may wish to ask questions of the future. I personally have a deep interest in a very special, specific area, that of telepathy or thought reading. And when you put into practice the techniques I shall explain, you may gradually develop to a degree whereby you can duplicate some of the experiments you may have seen me perform in concerts or on television. Further tests and equipment will be found in my Kreskin ESP game. Since ESP, as I mentioned earlier, seems to function more on an unconscious level, the question arises, how do we activate the unconscious area of our thinking? We do things unconsciously every day of our lives, such as driving, walking, and breathing. The imagination is the best method that I know for tapping the unconscious. For example, you cannot easily cause your heart to beat faster, but if you imagine yourself being chased by a tiger, your heart will react with a change of pace. In telepathic testing, a basic principle is that you concentrate 
but without too much effort. In other words, you fix your attention on a series of ideas and hold them in your mind easily. In this manner, the ideas tend to flow about and circulate in your thinking patterns. Here is a test of the imagination, and with practice, you should be able to do it without my guidance. The beauty of it is that it has nothing to do with trances or any hocus pocus. Close your eyes. Now, if you tried to open your eyes at this moment, you'd be able to, so don't try as yet. Keep your eyes closed and imagine in your mind the number one. Keep picturing this number. Even if you can't visualize it, make believe you can. That's all that's necessary. Now gradually convert the number one into the number two. You're going to slowly count with visualization to the number five. All right, erase that number two. And now visualize, picture, imagine the number three and keep picturing that number. You see, when you get to five, you're going to cause your eyes to become, in a sense, sealed so that it will be impossible. It will seem impossible to open them. Erase the number three. Now visualize the number four. Now that you come to the number five, make it as large as you can in your mind's eye. You are now using your imagination. And since you are, you can seal your eyes as long as you picture the number five. While you may be able to raise your eyebrows, you can't open your lids as long as you imagine the number five. If you were to stop thinking of it, if you were to stop picturing it, you would be able to open your eyes. Keep holding that number five, and you'll find that you can't really raise your lids. Your attention, your imagination is so deeply involved in the number. Stop picturing the number. Think of anything else, and lo and behold, you can open your eyes. You see, you are able to passively respond to an idea. Practice the simple test, and you'll begin to learn to guide your avenues of thought. For centuries, philosophers have talked about this so-called power of positive thinking. Too often, we use the power of negative thinking. Just as you mentally paralyzed your eyes so that you found you could curtail your ability to open them, so in the same way you can inhibit your full capacity in sports or the arts or in your schoolwork or in your profession. Instead, you should picture a positive follow-through whenever you can, if you have any real desire to improve. In this way, you will affect your productivity, but at the same time, somehow, you will tend to influence others constructively. Here is another test in which your imagination will create a control over your nervous system. At the same time, I think you realize there is an essence in this of truth, such basic truth, as to how you will be able to exert a greater control and influence over your life's activities, whether you're improving in some skill or way of thinking or perhaps future development. Close your eyes. Listen to my voice. Once again, once you master this particular test, you will not need or of necessity have to listen to this phase of the recording. And yet in about two minutes, Perhaps one minute, you're going to find uncontrollably that you have to swallow because your mouth will begin to salivate. It will begin to water. It may be happening already. An idea can be that powerful. But if it hasn't happened already, start to visualize in your mind's eye a lemon, a yellow, juicy, fresh, Lemon, imagine that in front of you someone is inserting a knife into the lemon. And as they slice through, the moisture, the juice is oozing out of the lemon 
dripping down. The more you think about this, the more you almost spontaneously feel your mouth watering, watering just as if you were tasting that lemon. Imagine that you were placing that lemon against your lips. Just think of this and sucking it. And notice how your mouth tends to water, to salivate. There are times when individuals may actually begin to taste a change that could be that likened to a lemon. But you have just seen another experiment in which your imagination can produce a response in your physical and in your nervous system. All of you listening to the instructions on this record are now going to hold a seance. Make certain that before you begin, you have certain ideal conditions. For one thing, have the room dimly lit. Four or more of you should now sit evenly distributed around a table. Although the experiment will often succeed with only three people, Whatever the size of the table, make certain that the legs are solid and do not give. In other words, don't use a folding or a card table. The table may have three or four legs. And while it may be quite solid, it should stand away from any furniture or barriers. Have the size according to the number of people participating. If there are only four people, a small serving table or perhaps telephone or side table or a small living room table will do quite well. If the group is larger, the table will of necessity be larger. Otherwise, you might have a number of small tables with sitters at each. This is equally effective. As a group, you may be either seated or standing. You will note on the jacket photo that your hands should be placed palm down, lightly on the table, nearer to the edge than to the center. Do not press hard. Simply have your hands lightly touching the table surface. Now the fingertips should be spread apart. At the same time, allow the tips of your little fingers to touch your neighbor's little fingers. Again, I must stress that all of you should be evenly distributed around the table. You have now formed an endless chain, and this is psychologically important to create what we call a phenomena of table tilting or wrapping. And it is absolutely necessary that this contact continue throughout the seance. Now listen carefully to these instructions and ideas. Sometime during these remarks, you're going to feel the table start to move and to tilt. Again, maintain your circular contact at all times, even if you have to stand or to walk in order to follow the table as it moves at times about the room. You may feel a vibration in the table. You must wait in expectation. And believe me, the table will tilt, perhaps first of all on one side. When this occurs, let it. Don't try to stop its movements. What is so startling is that this will work if you give it a chance, no matter how skeptical or questioning you may be. But you must give it a chance. Just wait, and it will happen, probably before this record ends. Indeed, once the table starts wrapping and tipping, you will not require my suggestions for it will seem almost possessed by itself. 
And yet, this is a natural phenomena without spirits or ghosts. It almost seems as if your collective minds were exercising a control over an inanimate object, your table. Your concentration upon that table aids the action. And as I said, once it starts, it's almost as if nothing could stop it. The more you concentrate upon the table, the more dramatic the movement. These instructions and your concentration upon that table are bound to produce results. Think that the table will react, and believe me, it will. Believe for the time being that it will move. Once it begins to rock, you need not even believe anything, for it will work in a sense almost by itself. Do not try to consciously help it or force it. This is totally unnecessary. It will seem to come of action by itself. Think over and over that the table will rock and that the table will tilt. Don't say anything out loud yet. That is, until this record is over. Once it is over, once it has shut off, no remarks, no comments could interfere. The table will continue seemingly to reverberate and to vibrate and to rock on its own. The table and its action will continue so long as you maintain your circle and so long as you desire it to continue. The table will tip towards you or then again sideways or it will tilt at times away from you. Sometimes it will rise off of one leg. It will sometimes rise off of two legs. At times it will take off and rise off three legs with only one leg maintaining contact with the floor. It's as if that table is going to come to life. At times it may almost seem to rise and to move about the room. Believe me, it's a wild experience, and it works if you maintain your attention on the table and keep thinking that it will move and keep thinking that it will tilt and it will tip and continue to react as if the table were coming to life. Keep imagining life into that table, life into its legs, Think of it rising. It will tilt. It will move. And once it reacts, it will become stronger in its motion, in its action, in its activity. In your mind, almost believe that it can float. You don't have to really believe it fully. Just think it. Concentrating on it will bring action, will bring life into that table. Once the table is tilting and this record has shut off, you may address questions to the action of the table. One rap, one fall of that table on the floor signifies a yes answer. Two raps, two knocks on the floor indicate a no answer. You may spell messages by calling out loud a letter of the alphabet, one letter after another as the table reacts, the first rap indicating A, the second rap B, the third C, and so forth. And once answers are coming forth, ask the table to spell a name by which you can continue to address it throughout the experience. Keep thinking movements into the table. In a sense, your thoughts are bringing it to life. It's an uncanny experience, and it works. It actually will move, and the movements, once they start, continue with increased force. At times, the tilting may become almost overactive and violent in its impact. But keep your attention on the table. And most of all, maintain the circle. Believe it can tilt. Believe it can move. Believe it can walk. Believe it can rise. No matter where it will go, stay with it. Even if you have to stand from your chair, follow it. Let it continue. The power will intend to increase its tilting, swaying, moving, and rising. 
It will move more and more so, stronger and stronger. By itself, it will seem to take on an action as if it had a hidden motor, making it move, making the table tilt, making the table walk, making the table rise, almost bringing it to life. It is your concentration which is putting life into that table. Concentrate on it and it comes to life and it moves more and more and more. Don't be afraid. It works. It has to move. Just keep concentrating, 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 concentrating.